Well, welcome back to another episode of Continuum Meditations Discusses. In this episode, I am going to be reviewing the ninth episode of the Exorcist TV series entitled Ritual and Repetition. As always, there will be spoilers incorporated into this analysis, both from the first and second season of the program. So if for whatever reasons you have not seen Ritual and Repetition and you don't want to be spoiled, of course, this is your fair warning to take the next exit. And of course, if that doesn't bother you, then this is your fair invitation to take the long way home with me as we go forward with this review of the penultimate episode of this season of The Exorcist Ritual and Repetition. So without any further ado, let's get started. Well, folks, this uh, episode was somewhat interesting to me. I didn't find it all that particularly great. I think it was a good episode that I would probably give perhaps at least 3 to 3.25 stars out of 4. Uh, it was heavy, a lot on a lot of, uh, I guess you could say, action this time around for The Exorcist, which was fine. But I I don't know, there was seemed, seemed to be something missing to me in this particular episode that I, I don't know, was just not totally appealing to me, although I did like it for the most part. But we began the episode with Tomas being out like a light in Andy's house. As we open the episode, this time, of course, Marcus is trying to wake Tomas up. He, re he cannot be woken. Marcus, of course, can't wait for Tomas to snap out of it, so this time he decides to leave Tomas inside the closet and go on a search for Andy and the kids. As the scene continues, Tomas now envisions himself back in Chicago inside uh, St. Saint Bridget's, I believe is the name of the church that he was supposed to take possession of. This is the church that Tomas would have been, would have presided over had he stayed in Chicago and continued his priestly career. This, of course, all of this is an illusion created by the demon to try to trick Tomas. Well, we move forward from there to see in the next scene that there are two assassins that have been sent by the conspiracy to find Tomas and Marcus in the real world. We are outside of the vision at this point. These assassins, I assume, have been sent by the conspiracy and they are there to, in fact, murder Marcus and Tomas. They find the truck that those two have been driving around the country. They close in on it, but as they do, they are assailed by Mouse. Mouse, in the process of this little battle, manages to kill both these assassins and then take off from there to try to find Tomas and Marcus herself. What interested me here was looking at how easily Mouse terminated these two guys. Mouse has become a very strong and hardened warrior in the name of God. She is no longer the timid little creature that Marcus used to call his little church mouse. She is now a very strong, capable warrior, a fighter. She learned to fight somewhere. She learned to stand up for herself and take care of herself. And in the process, she is now able to take care of others when they need this. If we do go forward with her, I would like to see some more backstory on how she developed after Marcus left her behind when he realized he could not complete the exorcism on her back in 1999. I'd like to see some more backstory on Mouse at this point, how she became the woman that she is that we see now versus the woman she was 18 years ago. We move forward from there to see that Marcus himself is now searching the home of Russell and Colleen Holstrom to try to find the, the kids to find out if this is where Andy went after he got himself free. So as we make our way through this scene, we see that Marcus is managing to successfully track and figure out what happened between Andy and Verity and Rose in the house. He sees that Verity was shoved up against a mirror and had her head bashed and fell down unconscious. He finds that there was a struggle in the house between Rose and Andy that culminated outside on the porch in the backyard where he, Andy was stabbed with a pitchfork and he ultimately sees that both she and Verity were dragged away at some point. We have Marcus the polyglot, we have Marcus the Mac Daddy, we've got Marcus the Exorcist, and now of course it seems like we've got Marcus the Detective and Marcus the Tracker. Marcus is obviously a man of many talents, so I'm wondering what other Renaissance capabilities he will prove himself to have as time goes on. Now, I'm not complaining. I like Marcus just like many of the rest of you do. So, but it is interesting to see these things being revealed about him 
these um, many, many shades of Marcus uh, as things move forward in the series. So we move on from there to see that uh, Andy has now found Harper and Shelby and Caleb at the dock where they were left by Rose. He manages to successfully convince Caleb first that he is okay and then he manages apparently apparently to convince Harper of the same. Shelby sees them, he goes over to them, and he tries to figure out what's going on with Andy. Shelby rightly suspects that there's still something very, very much wrong with Andy. I don't know if Shelby is insightful or was insightful enough to realize that Andy was still possessed, but he certainly did know that there was something still very wrong with him. Shelby does not want to leave the kids behind, the other two kids behind. Now, Andy continues to play a little game with these, with these guys until he's ready to make his move with them and ultimately he even tells Harper after you know he asks after Andy asks her do you believe that I'm okay and Harper responds to him by telling him you know I think you killed my mom you know very very angrily of course she's angry about that but you know Andy plays the game back or throws this back in her face would be a better way to say it by saying you know what Maybe it was God that killed your mom, not me. So, you know, it, these kinds of games continue to persist between Andy and the kids until he's finally ready to make his move and get them in that old witch's house that, uh, that he is ultimately going to try to kill all of them in. Tomas at St. Bridget's. So at St. Bridget's, Tomas is leading Mass. And lo and behold, who do we see in the congregation, in the audience, but... Casey Rance herself show up. Well, yay. How about that? Well, welcome back, Hannah Kasulka. She, of course, is not playing the real Casey Rance in the storyline. She's playing the Casey Rance that is an illusion that is being created by the demon inside of Tomas's mind. But it's still wonderful to see Hannah Kasulka as Casey Rance come back into the storyline. She meets with Tomas inside his head the demon begins to try to at first make him think that this is the real Casey Rance and that she is still in fact having some kind of problem with the demonic. Tomas begins to realize of course that you know number one they saved Casey Rance last year he and Marcus but anyway the demon plays a, 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 a something of a complex game with with Tomas where it tries to get him to feel guilty. It tries to tell him there were a lot of people who depended on you at St. Anthony's and look what happened to them all because you wanted to run off and play exorcist and try to feel special about yourself. They bulldozed St. Anthony's, all those parishioners had nowhere to go, and even the people at St. Bridget's who you abandoned, they don't even have a, a bishop now or, or a priest to preside over there to lead their flock now because you wanted to run off a, into the sunset and feel like you were on some kind of special mission from God. Well, it doesn't work. All of these guilt trips and attempts to play on Marcus, I mean, Tomas's vanity and, and, and his feelings of inadequacy at leaving all this past life behind, maybe at leaving his sister and her son behind, don't work on Tomas. And he successfully manages to fight the demon off in terms of these mind games that it's trying to play, play against him. And this actually does, in fact, help to weaken the demon and help to break its hold on him, but that hold is not totally broken. We move back from there to see that Andy and the family are inside the old witch's house. Shelby, you know, kind of mans up here a little bit, and he says to the demon that I was on to you from the very beginning, and I knew what was going on. Well, Andy kind of concurs with that. He says, yeah, you were on to me, but at the same time, you weren't on to me enough where you actually understood how to deal with me. He says, Andy, that is, says that lamb's blood only works for against, uh, well, only works to satiate God's wrath. It doesn't do anything to stop my wrath. Now, for those of you who don't know what Andy was talking about, or the demon in that sense was talking about, he's talking about the biblical story of Israel being freed from Egypt during the time when the Egyptians had place the Israelites in bondage, in slavery. You know the story of, of Exodus 19, the idea of the whole idea of the Jewish rite of, and ritual of Passover, and you know the idea of the ten plagues that God sent against Egypt to convince the Pharaoh, that is the king of Egypt, to release the Israelites from slavery. The Pharaoh refused, and then God uh, sends the angel of death to kill all the firstborn children of Egypt, 
The Israelites are commanded by Moses to spread lamb's blood over their lampposts and doors to cause this angel to pass over their homes, and thus the Jewish ritual or rite uh, of, of celebrating and honoring Passover as the day that God's wrath was poured out against the land of Egypt and the Israelites were set free from bondage and the angel of death passed over, passed over, passed over, get it? Uh, passed over the Israelites and allowed them to live and allowed their children to live but smote the land with death and killed the firstborn children of Egypt. This was very dramatically depicted in the 1956 film The Ten Commandments directed by Cecil B. DeMille and starring the late Charlton Heston as Moses. So if any of you are interested in perhaps understanding that story better from a dramatic point of view outside of the, just the biblical story and Jewish tradition, you can watch that movie and you'll probably get some very good ideas of how that was depicted. This is what Andy is talking about to Shelby when he says lamb's blood only works on God's wrath. It does nothing to stop my own. And as I had mentioned in a previous video, I we, when we saw Shelby spreading lamb's blood over the door of the family home to try to stop whatever he thought was going on, it was incorrectly applied. Shelby obviously is a person of faith, but his faith is kind of simplistic and is not based in a lot of knowledge. It's based more in experience, and that's fine, but as far as his literacy and understanding, I had pointed out at that point that it was clear to me that Shelby was not going to be the person to confront this demon in any kind of proper way because he did not have enough knowledge to be able to deal with it. And thus the presence of Marcus and Tomas coming into the picture was vital if anything was going to happen to stop this demon in this family's household. As we move forward uh, to in, in the rest of this scene, we see that Andy is wa continuing to walk around you know, trying to make his choice about who he's going to kill first. Rose sticks her neck out for the family at this point. She stands up to him and tells him how weak he is and how he he, uh, he is just, you know, just nothing. That she's talking to the demon, not to Andy now. Uh, and Andy decides, okay, well, Rose, we're going to make an example out of you first because you decided to open your mouth and, and say all this stupid stuff to me. So he takes Rose out to the well where the old witch was supposed to have thrown kids down down that well after she poisoned them and he suspends Rose over the, over the well telekinetically. She's hanging over the well in midair. Andy begins to tell her to count, count to 10. Well, she refuses. She tells him to go to hell and she refuses. He starts to count to 10 himself. And as he's doing so, the planks beneath Rose's feet began to break by themselves. Well, obviously they're breaking because the demon is using its power to break them. But anyway, they start breaking. And as he continues to count, the, the planks continue to break, the boards be continue to break, until finally Rose is dropped into the well and it is presumed that she dies. Now as we move forward, we continue to see back in Tomas' uh, trance state inside the closet, he is still having this vision between himself and the demon Casey, where he is at St. Bridget's, still trying to confront this demon and still trying to get it out of his head. One of the things that interests me about this is the fact that you continue to see the demon is attacking on truth two fronts. It's attacking in the form of Andy against the kids and Rose in, in the real world, but it's still using its power over Tomas to keep him distracted and keep him neutralized effectively by fighting against him inside its head. Once again, this does in fact show me just how strong this demon really is and how much power it has managed to gain uh, over time through the continued uh, practice of its craft, if you want to call it that. It tells Tomas that I don't deceive these parents into killing these children. I give these parents what they want. Well, that kind of implies that the demon, in, in addition, of course, to lying about what it's doing and by not deceiving anyone, but it kind of implies that what the demon is saying is that Hey, what I do is these give these parents the ability or the or the the opportunity to be free from their children. I know that these parents don't want these kids anymore, so I give them the opportunity, Tomas, to just say, "Hey, you know what? I don't want this little rat brat anymore." Okay, so I'm going to get rid of this little monster, and and just 
get it out of my life so I don't have to take care of this kid or kids anymore. This is what the demon seemed to be implying to me when it says it gave the parents what they want. It's a lie, but it, it, it seems to be the kind of implication that's going on. The demon then turns around and says, Tomasito, I can give you what you have always wanted to be the first Mexican Pope. You just need to bow down to me and submit to my will. Well, Tomas said, resists this and he says, at some other stage, when I was a different type of man, I would have wanted that. Now, the only thing I want to see is you die. And he resists the demon. The demon then begins to back away from Tomas because it realizes that its grip on Tomas is not as great as it would have hoped. Tomas begins to shout, I want to wake up, and then he finds himself back inside uh, and uh, the, the foster family house, but he's still not awake. He, he, he thinks he is, but he's not. He gets up, he gets out of the closet, and he sees the demon Casey coming towards him in her defiled form. He again proceeds to resist her, and the demon begins to plead with him and eventually begins to fight him. Well, this shows, once again, that the authority that, that, these, that, that Satan and his minions have only the authority which you give to them. And it gives more credence to the whole idea of the notion that if you resist the devil, he will flee from you. And so this shows these, these, these attempts to intimidate Tomas and biting him and attacking him physically inside of the vision, inside of his trance state. These things don't show that the, that the demon is in control. These things actually show that the demon is losing control, and it is losing the battle against Tomas. Marcus comes along. He finds the kids first in the house where he frees them so that they can get away. And then, after that, he goes in search of Verity and finds her fighting Andy out in the woods. He rescues her, and then he gets into a scuffle with Andy. Marcus is able to subdue Andy at this point and they are able to get him back where they're going to try to continue the exorcism. So all of this comes together when inside of Tomas's vision he is finally beginning to wake up. Andy is resisting the, de the demon inside of his own mind and he tells Tomas that I'm not going to be able to keep doing this for much longer. You have to find the kids, keep them safe, and you have to do as much as you can to stop this demon before I lose total control. As Tomas is being told this by Andy, we now hear Mouse praying over Tomas. And as he begins to wake up, as she begins to say these prayers of grace over him and protection, Tomas actually does begin at this point to really snap out of things and he really begins to wake up now. And now he is aware that he's back in the real world and there's Mouse standing over him saying, I've come a long way to find you. This is where the storyline ends and this is where we're going to pick up with the final episode of this season entitled unworthy in our next review so until next time exorcist fans we'll see you then